Well, uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the Green Party pre-budget uh, update and briefing. Um, the purpose of the briefing today is to outline the Green Party's analysis and critique of the government's uh, economic and fiscal strategy. It's to release a report we commissioned from Burl looking at the long-term fiscal implications of the proposed asset sale program. And then it's to talk about some of the Green Party proposals for alternatives for the budget on Thursday. Now, the sale of um, state-owned asset companies, or the, the power companies, is, if you like, the signature policy um, of this government. Uh, and yet there's been surprisingly little done about the long-term fiscal and economic implications of the proposed asset sale program. And for this reason, we commissioned Burl to do some work uh, looking at those long-term um, uh, fiscal and also economic implications. And we'll be launching that report later. Um, it's the report's called Asset Sales, the Government Accounts of the New Zealand Economy. And uh, the chief author is Dr. Ganesh Nana, uh, who's the chief economist from Burl. And uh, Ganesh will be speaking after me. We'll take, uh, there'll be time at the end for questions uh, for both of us. So, try not to knock any on this. Uh, so looking at the, I've just got a slideshow, I like slideshows, um, and so what I'm going to cover is um, do a bit of an outline looking at uh, starting with the economic rebalancing and some analysis of how economic rebalancing is going, um, looking at some of the fiscal choices that the government's made and the impact on the budget of those fiscal choices, looking at the key findings from the Burl report, um, uh, Ganesh will elaborate later. Uh, but looking at some of the key findings of the asset sale program in terms of the fiscal position, and then looking at some of the alternatives that the Greens have been proposing around smart green economic alternatives. Um, <clears throat> so just to start with economic rebalancing. Now, when Bill English uh, took over as Minister of Finance, he made, I thought, some very good um, analysis, some, some good analysis and some good comments about the challenges facing the New Zealand economy. Um, after nine years of labour, we had very high private sector external debt, um, and that was a big problem, and we had a very large current account deficit. And so he said we needed to rebalance the economy, and we agree with him about that analysis. It is critical to rebalance the New Zealand economy. But when you start to look at what's happened, and I think after three and a half years we've got the right now to make some judgment calls about how successful or not national have been in rebalancing the economy, um, the outcomes aren't that great. Even um, even the ANZ chief economist, uh, Cameron Bagri, has come to the conclusion that, in fact, what we're seeing at the moment isn't um, export lead growth. Uh, what we're looking at is a 4% current account deficit. That's an $8 billion current account deficit at a time of record commodity export prices. So even when we've had record prices for commodity exports, we're still running a 4% current account deficit. And that's a huge problem um, for the New Zealand economy. One of the key indicators, if you like, of, of the um, rebalancing or not of the New Zealand economy is the current account deficit. And as we can see, the, the, the solid line is the actuals, where we, we're at a 4% current account deficit. The dotted line is the projections. And as you can see, we're projected by Treasury for our current account deficit to go down to 6.7%, or rather increase to 6.7% of GDP. So based on the government's own projections, you would have to say that economic rebalancing is not working. Uh, the government's proposals so far have not led to the kind of rebalancing that we need. And one of the parts of that would be if the export sector was doing well, but we know from the business operations survey that was released a month or so ago that the proportion of New Zealand businesses that are exporting is hardly changing. Uh, it's pretty much a flat line. <coughs> and when we look at our net international investment position, this is from the pre-election economic and fiscal update done by Treasury. We can see that the net international investment position is getting worse and is projected to get worse. So this would have to be one of the key criteria on which we judge the government's performance. And on their own um, materials released just before the election, the position is getting worse, it's not getting better, which is of course exactly what you'd expect with the growing current account deficit. And part of that, I mean just to look at one sector that I think is very um, illustrative of what's going on is the manufacturing sector. For the three calendar years of this government, manufacturing has declined um, in each of those years. Even in the third year, when 
The GDP as a whole grew marginally. The manufacturing sector still declined. Now, manufacturing is about 20% of our merchandise trade exports. It's a critical sector if we want our economy to rebalance. We can't just rely on selling dairy products to the world. We also need elaborately transformed manufacturers. It has to be a critical part of it. And what we're seeing on these figures is that the manufacturing sector is still in trouble. So that's looking at economic rebalancing. And I think that there's a very strong case to be made when you, either when you look at current account deficit, you look at the export sector, when you look at the net um, international investment position, that economic rebalancing is not happening. Um, and that was one of the government's criteria that it set for itself. The second area I want to touch on, of course, will relate very, very much to the budget, which is about the fiscal position of the government. Um, and what the argument I want to make is that the fiscal position of the government is to a large degree, but not entirely, to a large degree a result of some very poor fiscal decisions that they've made. The first one, of course, has had a lot of traction lately, which is about the 2010 tax switch. Um, so the government at the time claimed that it would be broadly fiscally neutral. Uh, we've looked at the numbers around that, and we would argue that, in fact, over the 18 months since it's come into play that we have figures for, you're looking about a $2 billion deficit. Um, now, the government has challenged these figures and said that they're not accurate, um, but when we've asked the government to release any evidence around that, they failed to do so. We've put our numbers out there, we've put our analysis out there, but so far the government has failed to produce any evidence to show that the tax switch was actually fiscally neutral. And our figures show that, in fact, it was about a $2 billion deficit in 18 months. Again, when you look at the earthquakes, so the government um, rightly said the earthquakes have been a significant pressure on the government's fiscal position. We agree with that. The question is, what do you do about it? Um, so we proposed an earthquake levy uh, that would raise about a billion dollars a year. Um, the government um, <coughs> basically is going to borrowing. They, they floated this idea of the earthquake Kiwi bonds um, in order to raise low interest loans, effectively 2% loans. They've raised about $26 million so far, which is essentially nothing to pay for the rebuild. We're talking a $5.5 billion cost on the government account. Um, if, a, if the earthquake levy had been in place, we would have raised a billion dollars by now. Um, and we would pay the five and a half billion in about five and a half years. And then on the spending side, the government's making a series of poor quality spending decisions. Now obviously when you look at the roads of national significance, this is a $14 billion project over a decade. That puts enormous pressure on the government's fiscal position. Um, but it does more than that. Aside from putting pressure on the fiscal position, it creates an obstacle to rebalancing. We spent $8 billion importing oil last, financial, last year, um, and that is a huge pressure on the external accounts for New Zealand. What the roads of national significance do is lock in oil dependency. When, at a time when the IMF is predicting uh, that we will see a doubling in oil prices over a decade, the government is spending $14 billion to lock in oil dependence. This will be a tremendous drag on the economic balance of our economy because we have to pay for all that oil that we import, as well as a huge fiscal pressure on the government's books. And then of course there's the ETS subsidies, um, 1.7 billion thereabouts over three years. Um, <clears throat> again, this puts enormous pressure on the fiscal position of the government, but it also has economic implications. Um, one of the biggest studies that was done looking at the impact of carbon prices on economies was the Australian Federal Government, the Treasury. And what the, the Treasury in Australia, when they analysed carbon prices, the conclusion they came to is that the longer you leave it, the bigger the economic costs. You're actually better to have the price on carbon up front because then you can get the adjustments and you also attract investment because you're one of the early movers. And so one of the conclusions from those kind of studies is actually in terms of economic rebalancing, you're better to introduce a carbon price early rather than protect a part of the economy behind a subsidy wall, which is what we're currently doing in New Zealand. We have a subsidy wall in front of the agricultural sector. So taxpayer covers the cost of the emissions coming out of that sector, we subsidise it, instead of the price running through and producing the kind of adjustments that we need. So that's, um, that's looking, to, if we look at some of the fiscal choices of the government, we can see that on the revenue side they've made some poor fiscal choices, on the spending side they've made some poor fiscal choices. So effectively they put the budget into a hole and now New Zealanders are having to pay for their mistakes. Um, in terms of whether it's an increase in prescription charges, whether it's larger class sizes, less affordable housing, the poor decisions of the government on the budget put it into a hole and ordinary New Zealanders have to pay the price. But there are a few decisions that are as poor as the decision that they're proposing to make around asset sales. And now I just wanted to take a few um, quotes from um, the Burr report around the fiscal impact and economic impact of asset sales. <coughs> 
First thing is that basically the asset sale program will leave the government accounts worse off. That's both in terms of if we go down this path of selling our assets. It's a completely reckless decision. <clears throat> okay, so finally, I just want to touch on some of the smart green economic alternatives. Now, obviously, the Greens um, talked a lot about this in the election campaign, um, but it's, it's partly it's about looking at what the opportunities are. Um, so we need to think about what the opportunities are for New Zealand, uh, and we need to back ourselves to take advantage of those opportunities. <coughs> Now, of course, the, this is a quote from the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, which is a government agency. So even the government's own agency is talking about the opportunities that are available to New Zealand, particularly in the geothermal sector. Um, because what's happening is that globally, clean energy is growing quite rapidly. Um, now, obviously, we're not experts on every part of clean energy, but one part that we are leaders on is geothermal. Geothermal is growing. Mighty River Power... Um, has expertise in this area and, you know, tragically it is targeted for the first round of privatisation. Um, so we, the Greens believe we should use Mighty River Power and the other state-owned enterprises as a base, as an export base for New Zealand which we can build on rather than selling them off. The risk if you sell them off is that the headquarters move overseas, the research and development moves overseas and New Zealand just becomes a profit centre for a multinational. Um, it's much more important that we keep them here and that they can partner with private sector entrepreneurs and partners rather than the whole thing um, ending up in overseas ownership. <coughs> now likewise, um, Pure Advantage, um, that, you know, they're talking about a $6 trillion per, uh, per year worldwide market. Now green growth is, is growing internationally, it is a huge opportunity for New Zealand. Now whether the Pure Advantage is a group of leading New Zealand business people, um, Stephen Tindall, many others, um, now, obviously, you know, you could put a large number in here, and nobody can be exactly sure how large this number is, but we know that the global market for green technology is growing very rapidly and is enormous. <coughs> so I like to think that we have, uh, it's like a, a it is a triangle of opportunity. Um, so one way to think about it, right? Um, and so there are opportunities for our country, which both have positive effects in terms of fiscal resilience, because we do need to improve the fiscal resilience of the New Zealand government, it has opportunities in terms of economic rebalancing because we do need to rebalance the New Zealand economy to deal with the imbalances that we currently have. And I would argue that it, there's a nice relationship there with smart, smart green economics, um, that they go together in a, in a really positive way. It is a very, um, in terms of the relationship between the three, there are real positive relationships between them. Now, whether you look at capital gains tax, um, which is something obviously we've been promoting for a while, which has the advantage of, in terms of rebalancing, it drives capital into the productive sector. In terms of fiscal resilience, it has, in the long term, it has very positive effects on the government books. It doesn't raise a lot of money in the short term, but it does over the, over the medium term. And in terms of smart green economics, it means that there's capital available for the investments we need to make in the green economy, which is the growing sector internationally. And the same applies to a series of, of initiatives here, whether it's transport spending, as I talked about earlier, improves our external accounts, good for the environment, good for the government's books, whether it's looking at the price of water, 
um, so that we drive efficiencies in the primary sector around the price of water, whether it's the home insulation scheme, which will have great fiscal effects because it reduces pressure on the health budget, boosting R&D, New Zealand's way behind on R&D compared to our OECD partners, whether it's higher standards for fresh water to protect our clean and green brand, which is fundamental to our export sector, whether it's mining royalties, where we have low mining royalties and we don't have a fund like Norway does, whether it's having a real price on carbon, so we get the efficiencies we need through the economy, um, whether it's a public option for Kiwi savers, so that we have a low cost option for people so that they can save for the future, whether, as I was talking earlier, it's about supercharging our state-owned energy companies so that they're an export base for us, or whether it's investing in children, uh, which is fundamental to our future. We need to invest in those children so that they don't become a huge cost in the future, but also so they make a great contribution to the future of our economy. Whether it's any of those things, I, I think that you can see that New Zealand does have great opportunities where we can improve our fiscal resilience, do economic rebalancing, and embrace the smart green economy. Um, those are the positive options. Um, and in terms of what I've talked about today, I've tried to identify what I think are the, um, the results if you look at economic rebalancing. Um, the National Party government ha it hasn't led to economic rebalancing after three and a half years. When you look at the fiscal decisions that this government's made, both on the revenue side and on the spending side, I think you can argue that they've made some very poor fiscal decisions which have put the budget into a big hole. Whether you look at the economic and fiscal impacts of the privatisation program, and Ganesh will talk about more of that in a second, um, or whether you look at the smart green economic opportunities, which we're missing out on because the government hasn't grasped it. Um, I think there are real alternatives to what the government's proposing on Thursday. I think we should be caught up in their rhetoric around there are no alternatives. There are good alternatives. We've put out some of them here. There are many others. Um, and I think that we should challenge the government around both their fiscal arguments and their economic arguments. And what we need to do as a country is embrace those smart green opportunities. <coughs> so I'm going to leave it there. Um, and I'll hand over to um, Ganesh to talk uh, specifically about his report um, and the, his findings in that report.